Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism Live! Shut up and sit down. All right, so there's no applause today. I'm running into lots of little hiccups with uh, with the technology not working, which is also going to affect, I think, our phone calls at the end. They may not be able to hear you again. But the Rodecaster Pro that I've got, it had some serious uh, malfunction today. And uh, we're going to figure it out by next week, but today it's not. So, RFM. Can you, can you hear me, Bill? I can hear you. You can okay. hear me, which means that the audience can hear us. And that much is good. Uh, I'd like to uh, say a, a hello to and kudos to Maven, who's behind the scenes. Everybody say hi to Maven. Uh, she is uh, a, was a huge help to me when I got on about an hour ago and notified me that nothing on my end was doing what it was supposed to do. RFM, welcome to Mormonism Live. Here we are. Uh, episode number 52. This is the one-year mark. Oh, my gosh. It is. Yep. One year of you and I doing a live call-in show. Um, deconstructing history, talking about current events, and we've got some current event uh, that today that we're going to unravel a little bit. We should do something to celebrate. What do you think? Should uh, should we I take a shot? Shot of whiskey on the on the air? What do you think? I was thinking more about pulling Elder Oak's trousers down and whacking his pee pee. <laughs> we are going to give him uh, a good spanking today. By the uh, way, I'm so sorry. I was looking at my sleeve because I just got this new T-shirt in the mail from a listener slash friend. And uh, that's what it says, says, that's what it says right there. You can see that. Can you see that, Bill? Yep, you're, go ahead. You're throwing something away in the garbage. No, no, I just had something block in the camera view. In the camera view, I didn't there we want go. I'll just lean go back. Ahead. That's a lot easier than, yeah. Born, born great. great. And you can see the small letter, which says, uh, some are born great because it's Shakespeare from Twelfth Night, Malvolio. Some are born great. Some achieve greatness. And some have greatness thrust upon them. Yeah. So anyway, this was very, very nicely sent to me in Christmas wrapping by a friend slash listener who I understand was having a nice trip to London and visiting the Globe Theater where they have a nice gift shop. Excellent, excellent. It is always nice, right? This you know, the audience gets to know you and me and they they feel like they they're building a kind of a relationship with the two of us. I mean, we when we said hi to all those people at Thrive, some of those people they know us as if we're good friends of theirs, right? We they mm -hmm. spend a lot of time with us even though we don't get to spend that time back with them. And uh, I think it's interesting when we do new things, have a new shirt. Like I had the one the other day with the lazy learner. Now you've got the one born great. And right. It's fun for people to get to know us. Oh, and by the way, I also have something back here under the lamp. What is? Oh, I see, even see that. It looks like it might be the sealed portion uh, of the gold plates, maybe. I think it's the whole deal. It's the whole it's shebang. the whole shebang. Nice. Underneath I, the light, too. Yes. And that was sent to, uh, to me by a listener as well. Ooh, love it. And I posted about it on my Facebook page with a very nice picture of it. It's just beautiful. Yeah, yeah. You've got a great uh, little uh, office there, my friend. I do. Thank you. Thank yeah, you yeah. for noticing. Yeah, I'm yeah. so happy about it to have a nice office finally toward the what I presume is going to be the end of my my legal career. But I finally got some nice lodgings, and the price was right. So I was scrambling behind before the show started, so I should close that drawer back there, but I'll do that later. Um Let's, uh, I guess I'm just discombobulated. Let's get it, uh, get us kind of kicked off here. Okay. Uh, so what we're going to talk about tonight is, uh, Elder Oaks a few weeks back. And I know Mormon stories covered it. I know that it's been spoken of in several places. Salt Lake Tribune did some coverage, which we'll point to them here later too. But, um, Elder Oaks was at a, at the university of Virginia, I think. Yep. And he was doing some sort of presentation, Q&A. There was two different sessions, and one of them was him talking. The other one is him on kind of a panel doing a Q&A. And uh, let's go ahead and throw that video up and start with that. But this is where Elder Oaks oh, – go, go ahead. I was just going to say, for clarity's sake, this is November 12th of 2021 when he's at the University of Virginia giving a speech, which is their annual, I believe, Joseph Smith Lecture. And the reason for that is because Kathleen Flake is there. She's, a, I believe she's a member of the church. She's certainly a, a noted uh, Mormon scholar. 
of Mormon studies. So she's there with him. And I think it's under those auspices that he is asked to address uh, a subject at the University of Virginia to begin with under the Mormon studies rubric. But he's also, of course, uh, a lawyer. He has a lot of background in the law. So he's giving um, a talk about the law. Yeah, and he does a Q&A portion, and here is the question and his answer. Oh, we don't have any sound. While we're looking for the sound, I'll just add that, interestingly, this Q&A portion was done prior to his lecture, as opposed to afterward. I'm not exactly sure how much before the lecture, but I did note that the lecture was professionally videotaped and uh, distributed in that way, and that Elder Oaks had even done a professionally videotaped promo yeah. for his lecture. Yeah. However, yep. it doesn't appear that this question and answer session was professionally videotaped as well. No, no. So somebody somebody got it, but here it is. Okay. So in June 2019, you said at a conference of BYU Hawaii, you said, and I quote, we are confronted by a culture of evil and personal wickedness in the world. This includes increasing power and phenomenon of lesbian, gay, and transgender lifestyles and values. So I have two questions for you. What have you done to be more progressive since that time, since 2019, to the LGBT community? And what have you done to address some of the things that you've done in the past, including the things that you said and overseeing the enforcement of electric shock and vomiting conversion therapy for LGBT students at the university? Let me say about electric shock treatments at BYU. When I became president of BYU, that had been discontinued earlier and it never went on under my administration. Put that to one side. <laughs> Let me begin to uh, try to answer your question from the Hawaii uh, remarks. Uh, bear in mind that my audience there was an audience of Latter day Saints. Mm -hmm. I have responsibilities when I teach people who follow Latter day Saint doctrine than I have when I speak as a representative of the church on what positions the church ought to take in society as a whole. And so uh, I think the, the correct answer to your question, the accurate answer to your question, is uh, number one, I understand uh, better the situation of the church in relating to society now than I did then. Partly by working on a lecture that I'll give tonight. I refer you to that lecture for part of the answer to your question. The other part is asking you to understand that the church has its unique doctrines. It does not try to make rules for all society. But we do make rules and set limits for our own membership. And they're uh, responsible either to receive that teaching or not. Uh, but don't judge a public or don't judge a private sermon by public issues. Okay, so um, let me see if I get that right. So here's, he's asked a question and he, the person asking the question says, in June of 2019, you said at a conference at BYU-Hawaii, we're confronted by a culture of evil and personal wickedness in the world. This includes the increasing power and phenomenon of lesbian, gay, and transgender lifestyles and values. So I have two questions for you. The, the guy asking the questions says, what have you done to be more progressive since that time, since 2019, to the LGBT community? And what have you done to address some of the things you have done in the past? including the things that you have said and overseeing the enforcement of electroshock and vomiting aversion therapy for LGBT students at BYU. And Oak starts off, he says, let me say about electroshock treatments at BYU. When I became president at BYU, that had been discontinued earlier and it never went on under my administration. And then he answers the, the first question and he essentially makes this argument, RFM, where he, he seems to say, I get to speak to two different crowds completely differently. I get to tell a group that of non-Mormons in a public arena one thing, and then I get to say something completely different to believing Mormons within a church context, and that's perfectly uh, appropriate, and I have that privilege, essentially. Did you get that from those two things? 
Uh, yes, I did. The first thing was a five pin hoaxio or pin oxio lie. Pinoxio. Five pin oxio <laughs> on that one. I just came up with that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. All the stuff I've written down is nowhere near as good. You come but, up with stuff quick. But yeah, that's totally, totally wrong. We'll get into some of the details because we can lock that down and prove it. And that uh, this was a statement that was not correct, did not reflect the historical uh, accuracy of what really happened under his administration when he was the president of BYU from 1971 to 1980. And I know we'll get into that a bit later. The other thing, if you want my comments about the other thing, I mean, I can understand. I can understand a church leader addressing uh, the subject of homosexuality, different with members than with a public audience, maybe. I can understand that. Uh, I want to try and give him as, as much charity as I can. I think the problem is, is that this is recent. It's 2019. He's not just talking about homosexuality. He's talking about the gay and lesbian agenda and labeling it as evil. That's yeah. one of the problems, because now he comes into this speech at the University of Virginia and he wants to portray himself as Mr. Nice Guy. And can't we all get along? Uh, yeah. And doing that, I think, is problematic because he is trying to, I believe, present a different face to both audiences. And he got caught doing it in both respects with the electroshock therapy and also with this recent statement from 2019. And I don't think that his answer to either was adequate. Yeah, you can see even when he, the moment he says that that hadn't happened under his administration, whoever the young lady is sitting by who's recording it, you can tell by her chuckle and her uh, the way she breathes out that that she knows he's lying or at least that he's caught in a dishonest statement or, a, or an untrue statement in that moment. And then even when he goes on to talk about how he can teach both sides, you can hear her chuckle again. Yeah. It, it's like it's like he's oblivious to what we all know who are aware of Mormonism and its messiness. And as you pointed out, Dallin Oaks is the president of BYU while this is happening. And there is enough anecdotal evidence to say that he is directly connected to implementing the shock therapy and giving the stamp of approval and letting it go on. And so we're going to go through some of that today, but I wanted to start off by setting at least a, a backdrop for Elder Oaks homophobia. And I have to go all the way back to 1984. And I want you to do that. But Please. by the way, by the way, I want you to go back to the 1970s and the electroshock therapy that actually did go on, on an experimental therapeutic basis at BYU under Elder Oaks administration. Cause I think that that we can establish that definitely we will later on this evening. And I think that it's even better to go back before 1984. By the way, one other thing I wanted to say about his last statement about one, one face to this audience and another face to this audience and don't judge a private sermon by a public uh, issues or whatever it was. What this struck me as this is the Lord of the Rings when Sam and Frodo are lost and they're trying to get to Mount Doom and they have to be led by Smeagol, right? Gollum, Smeagol, through the, what is it, the Emin Mule or whatever it is they're, they're, they're going through. And Smeagol knows the way. And at night, Smeagol will be up and the hobbits are asleep, or at least so he thinks. And he'll be talking to himself and he'll be talking about how much he hates the evil, nasty, wicked hobbitses and how he can't wait until he has his chance to lay his hands on them while they're both asleep. And then to their face, he presents a completely different picture. And he says, oh, Smeagol loves the nice hobbitses. We'll do anything for the nice hobbitses. And it, this is what I see him doing because it's on the same issue, dealing with the same people talking about the gay and lesbian agenda and over here by the dead of night, or at least from the University of Hawaii's devotional speech, they're evil. They are lumped into the category of evil. But now he comes over to the same audience in a different venue, a public venue, and he wants to pretend that he's their friend and we can all get along together as long as we uh, we want to live in peace. That was a theme he repeated over and over. Let's live in peace together. Yeah, it's a very dishonest way to operate. And it is talking out both sides of your mouth. 
practically literally. Um, and so I want to go back because I want to establish some of Elder Oak's homophobia because I think it's important to this conversation. So we will go back to the 70s. Don't worry about that, my friend. But let's start with 1984. And this is a, uh, a document that Elder Oaks, when he was called into the Quorum of the Twelve, remember, he was a Supreme Court uh, justice for the state of Utah, if I'm not mistaken. And he, his, you know, his expertise is as a lawyer. And so what he was asked to do was to write for the church a way in which the church should uh, navigate and handle the forthcoming issue of uh, legislation affecting the rights of homosexuals. And so he presents this. We have, you know, we have this document still. He presents this essentially to the Quorum of the Twelve and the top echelons of the church. And the whole goal here is to set up a framework, right, that the church can utilize in order to handle what they expect to happen throughout all of this process of LGBT folks fighting for legal rights within the U.S. government and legislation uh, that affects them. Um, any thoughts on this before I move on from this one? A couple of things. First off, the main overriding concern is to fight tooth and nail against gay marriage. That's the primary thrust of this and how to do it. And another secondary concern is to prevent homosexuals or gay people, lesbians, from having jobs where they can influence children. And this includes teachers and other people who would be um, like role models for children. That's another thing that he wanted to avoid. And by the way, if you go to page 13, uh, Let's see, 13. I've got mine here in hard copy. I, we want where he says properly so. Yeah, parents, right yeah, parents who prefer in a society which prefers male female marriages and procreation should be able to insist on teachers and youth leaders who will teach and demonstrate or at least not contradict those values. So there's that part. Don't want to get bogged down here. There is something that's very interesting that happens at the bottom of page six. Because I think we all remember a few years ago when we were kind of shocked to have video surface of Elder Bednar. I think he was south of the border. There was a translator involved. I think it was Spanish. But uh, when he was asked what we can do as Latter-day Saints to be more welcoming to homosexual members of the church. And do you remember his response, Bill? Uh, there are no homosexual members of the church. I'm going to change the question, right? Uh, there are no homosexual members of the church. Right. And it's funny because he did say, I'm going to change the question. And then he didn't change the question. <laughs> he just kind of answered in a way that made everybody go, what are you talking about? There's no homosexual yeah. members of the church. That concept that Elder Bednar enunciated there, much to a lot of people's perplexity, is actually set forth in this document by Elder Oaks from 1984, where at the bottom of page six, he has this footnote. Okay. Elder Boyd K. Packer recognized the important distinction between acts and tendencies and stressed the temporary nature of the tendency or the condition of homosexuality in his March 5th, 1978 BYU Fireside, which is published in pamphlet form, or at least used to be, under the title To the One. Now, Don't here's the touch deal. your little factory. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a distinction they've been trying to make all along. Homosexuality is a temporary condition that can be repented of. Okay, that's their concept. We don't label some. Oh, and if you can still have that that uh, page six at the bottom, um, they they don't want to talk about homosexuals. There are no such thing as homosexuals from this point of view. There are people who struggle with same sex attraction, right? So they want to use the term only as an adjective, or yeah, I think an adjective is correct. Never as a noun, never homosexual, only homosexuality. So that's why he quotes Boyd K. Packer approvingly here to introduce the subject. I must use a word. Oh, could you do this in your Boyd K. Packer voice? You, you want me to read that right there? Yeah, to introduce. To introduce the subject, I must use a word. I will use it one time only. Please notice that I use it as an adjective, not as a noun. I repeat. I accept that word as an adjective to describe a temporary condition. I reject it as a noun naming a permanent one. That was beautiful. My You're gosh. Welcome. Thank you so much. And we didn't even have this plan, folks. He's that good just on the fly. But the main point of this is 
that when Elder Bednar says what he said, all he's doing is following the directive that was given in this memo, citing to Elder Boyd K. Packer from 1978, never use homosexual as a noun, only as an adjective, homosexuality, to talk about a temporary condition. I reject it as a noun naming a permanent one. And this is why I bet you dollars to donuts. Elder Bednar says something that sounds so remarkably obtuse as there are no homosexual members of the church. If you can see their reasoning, the moment you name it as a permanent condition, someone is born that way, they will exit that life that way and gender and attraction, all those kinds of things are eternal. Then the church has an entire mess on its hands because it can't solve the problem unless it changes its theology. Yes, and I apologize for getting in the way here of your laying out the basis, but I think it's very important that you lay out the history that Elder, um, who we're talking about, Elder Elder Oaks, Oaks. that Elder Oaks has with the homosexual issue as basically the church's consigliere dealing with this issue. And Elder Oaks, more than anyone else, when he gives a talk in general conference, I believe it is the exception rather than the rule when he doesn't at least touch on this subject somewhere in his talk, if he doesn't give the talk exclusively over to this subject. So this is very important to lay the groundwork for what I think he was trying to do at the University of Virginia and why it ended up failing so spectacularly because of the students who asked this question. And then the next one we'll go to is the interview with Dallin Oaks and Lance B. Wickman. And I just wanna say in what you were saying the last uh, moment, I, I thought I saw an Easter egg in what you were saying. Um, what did I say? Oh, you, when you use the word consigliere. Oh, hey, there was. You're right. Yeah, there was an Easter egg there. So I won't, I won't add any more. People can figure all that out on their own. And I probably but, mispronounced uh, it because I did not go to Japan on my mission. I went to Japan. I, I did not go to Italy on my mission. I went to, went Japan, to Japan, another one of the Axis powers. Yeah, yeah. So now we'll go to the interview with Lance Wickman and uh, we'll put that up on the screen. Um, I just want to note here the way this is asked. So public affairs, this is still on the church's newsroom site today, and I can't believe it. Um, it says that, so public affairs is asking Elder Oaks and Elder Oaks is with Elder Lance Wickman and they're answering questions on the LGBT issue. Right. And this is from 2006. Yeah. Thank you. And keep those things straight for me along the way. Uh, public affairs for the church says at what point does showing that love cross the line into inadvertently endorsing behavior? If the son says, well, if you love me, can I bring my partner to our home to visit? Can we come for the holidays? How do you balance that against, for example, concern for the other children at home? By the way, this always plays on the idea because it's in that document, the 1984 document too. They're always playing on the idea that gay is contagious and that if if you stay at my home too long gay, you might make my other kids gay. You might make me gay. You might make my neighbors gay. We don't know how far the gay goes. Um, and so this idea of how could it affect the kids? How do I balance that ex- against, for example, concern for the other children in the home as if they're negatively affected by having their gay sibling come for Christmas, right? right. Elder Oak says, that's a decision that needs to be made individually by the person responsible. Now, listen, he does a double bind here. We'll talk about double binds later. He starts off with this idea that it's an individual choice, which is great, except he keeps running his mouth, right? And now he's um, going to tell you what an apostle of the Lord would do. Yeah, so you can make up your own decision, but let me tell you what I would do. He goes, that's a decision that needs to be made individually by the person responsible. Calling upon the Lord for inspiration. I can imagine that in most circumstances, the parents would in most circumstances, the parents would say, please don't do that. Don't put us into that position. Surely if there are children in the home who would be influenced by this example, the answer would likely be that. There would also be other factors that would make that the likely answer. So he's telling you what the most prevalent answer should be. Yes. And then by the he's, way, notice how immediately he plays the victim card. Yeah. yeah and don't put he, us in that position. Yeah. 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 It's, it's the gay kid's fault. Yes. Uh, it's the, you know, the adult child. Because they uh, want to spend the holidays with their folks. Right. Which, you know, at this point, I can't imagine one of Elder Oak's kids would like to stay for Christmas, you know? Like, I'll be happy to go to the Holiday Inn uh, and stay there. He's saying, I can also imagine some circuits. So he lays out the majority answer, and yes. now he's giving the minority answer. Right. The good can... news about the good news about uh, being at Elder Oaks for Christmas is you don't have to turn on the TV to watch The Grinch because no. you got the live show going on in the living room. He insists that he sits at the head of the table. 
<laughs> Sorry, can, go ahead. No, no, you're good. I can also imagine some circumstances in which it might be possible to say, yes, come, but don't expect to stay overnight. Don't expect to be a lengthy house guest. Don't expect, to, expect us to take you out and introduce you to our friends or to deal with you in a public situation that would imply our approval of your partnership. That is so downright unhealthy, Great. hateful. It's unbalanced. It's it's just, it's, it's a horrible thing to say. So that's an important one. By the way, Maven, if you can go to the other quote in this uh, paper. And can I also mention, this please. is from the interview that was done with Public Affairs, an interview, I'm putting it in air quotes, right? Between Public Affairs and Elder Oaks and Lance Wickman, who's an elder at the time, at least. And it was from 2006. It is up currently on the LDS Church website. And I think you're probably accessing it live from the website right we now, are. aren't you, Bill? We, we are, yep. Yeah. Um, it seems to me that the church's current stance on homosexuality suggests that we have love and empathy and compassion. And, you know, obviously they're still separating the attraction from the actual act of sex. But it seems as though what I just read to you would be out of line with where the church is currently trying to frame itself and how it handles people who are, uh, as it would put it, and not my words, struggling with same-sex attraction, right? right? And and so I can't figure out for the life of me why this is that that quote is still up, why this entire paper from the public affairs, uh, Elder Wickman and Elder Oaks, are, is even up on the church's website, as you're pointing out. Here's the other one, because it has to do with the aversion stuff. Uh, Elder Oak says this, he says, the aversive therapies that have been used in connection with same-sex attraction have contained some serious abuses that have been recognized over time within professions. While we have no position about what the medical doctors do, we are conscious that there are abuses and we don't accept responsibility for those abuses. He's part of the abuses, Elder, uh, RFM. He's, he's the president of BYU. While this is happening, and as we'll get to in the evidence, he's he seems connected to it. It would be hard to believe the president of BYU doesn't know that gay people, gay students are being shocked to treat their homosexuality at his university. Right. And here's the deal. He's in the thick of this. So even if we extend him the charity of saying, well, maybe it was going on at BYU without his knowing about it, which I think the odds of that being actual are vanishingly small. This is in 2006. This is, what, 30 years later? Yeah. 89. Yeah. This is 30 years later after they were doing the experimentation. He has had plenty of time to figure it out. He's been immersed in this whole subject. I cannot believe that he does not know about this either at the time and certainly not by 2006 and definitely not by 2021 where he's given that talk at the University of Virginia. By the way, notice the language that's used. Okay. Always the passive tense. Mistakes were made with the implication being not by us. The aversive, ther what is it? The aversive therapies that have been used. Not that we did back in the 1970s and that other people did that have been used in connection with same sex attraction. And then I love the line. We are conscious that there are abuses. So we know that there are abuses. We're not saying that what we did was abusive. We're, we're not even saying that we did it. And we don't accept responsibility for those abuses. What kind of line is that, Bill? Yeah. And then he goes, even though they are addressed at helping people, we would like to see helped. We can't endorse every kind of technique that's been used, except almost assuredly, he did a endorse a technique of that sort that was used. Well, he absolutely did. And frankly, Bill, there is no reason for him to say we don't accept responsibility for those abuses unless he already is tacitly saying that they did happen and that he knows about them and they happened at BYU. If it never happened at BYU, if the church was never involved in this, it was it was just some other people out in left field doing it. Why would he ever say we don't accept responsibility for those abuses? Right, right, right. That would go without saying. It would go without saying. So once you start with the premise that he doesn't accept responsibility for the very abuses that he was at the main leadership position of, then you can start to understand why it's always deflection and obfuscation the rest of the way. 
Right. And it's painfully obvious to me. But then again, I've been a practicing lawyer for almost 32 years. And sometimes it takes a thief to catch a thief. <laughs> okay. So next, uh, I just want to point it out. I don't want to necessarily read it, but there's the October 2018 General Conference, uh, Truth in the Plan. And um, I just want to note here that Elder Oaks talks about how some are troubled by some of our church's positions on marriage and children. He talks about how the gospel dictates that they have to take those positions. He says that uh, gender is eternal. Before we were born on this earth, we all lived as male and female in the presence of God. Um, so there's all of that rhetoric. And then... Um, and that was October of 2017. Yes, that was a very important talk that he gave called The Plan and the Proclamation, where he says basically there's hardly a man who's still alive who remembers that famous day and year when we passed this um, proclamation on the family back in 1995. And I'm one of them, so let me tell you about it. And where he attempts by language to lift its importance to revelation, to being an inspired document. Yeah. Yep. And here's one paragraph that I thought was important from it. Is it okay, Bill? Yeah, please. Okay. Converted Latter-day Saints. By the way, notice the true Scotsman fallacy here, okay? Because it's going to say converted Latter-day Saints believe that the family proclamation is the Lord's re-emphasis of the gospel truths we need to sustain us through current challenges to the family. So Nothing if, new in there. Well, yeah. If you don't believe that, then you're not a converted Latter-day Saint. See, that's the beauty of the true Scotsman fallacy. Yeah, And then he gives two examples, but of course, the one he's driving at are same-sex marriage, and then he also throws in cohabitation with marriage, so he won't look like a complete homophobe. Mm, right, got to include that. Um, the last one I just want to make mention of is Elder Oaks and Anxiety in Stressful Times. This was at BYU Hawaii, and this, by the way, is the very thing that the questioner in the opening video that we played was using as his backdrop for his two questions. Elder Oaks, I just want to state, Elder Oaks, we all know this, Elder Oaks has a wide history of homophobic rhetoric, and he has used it his entire life. Anytime that we've been uh, privy to Elder Oaks public statements, they have included homophobic rhetoric. Yes, it's, it's only been interrupted by things like Mark Hoffman. But other than that, I mean, you know, these things, these things that kind of explode on the scene. Yeah. And but other than that, it is a clear pattern since I would say the 1970s, but 1984, when he's called upon to give the church's memo about how the church should approach this issue in the political sphere so as to come out victor. Of course, that really hasn't worked out too well. Right, right. So now I want to run through some of the evidence. I don't want to spend a ton of time here, but there's a few things I think we need to read. And Maven's got us a couple of videos to, to go along with it that I think will speak loud and clear to how atrocious this therapy was. Um, so let's start off. There is a, now this is an archive page. This is www.affirmation.org slash therapy uh, with all thy getting, I think is the, is the name of the document. Um, just a note here that Don Harriman here goes into great length to talk about, I think it's his personal experience at BYU with the shock therapy. He is specific uh, that it happened during the mid seventies uh, for him. So I just want to note that. So there's one person. By the way, the documentary evidence, which is conclusive, which we'll get to supports that. Good. Excellent. Um, perfect. The next one I've got is BYU uh uh, the th website is the salamander society.com. Um, let's see if she can get that one up there. And uh, John Cameron in this one said he was a, a naive and devout Mormon who felt out of sync, quote unquote, with the world when he volunteered to be a part of a study of electric aversion therapy in 1976 at Utah's Brigham Young University twice a week for six months he jolted himself with painful shocks to the penis to rid himself of his attraction to men. So there's one. Uh, next one, a Connell O'Donovan.com. And uh, this one, uh, let's see here. Yep. The long-term effects of electric shock therapy these men were subjected to has been crippling two of the men. This is out of the article. Two of the men committed suicide soon after completing this torturous study. Every survivor 
I have interviewed has has suffered lifelong emotional, spiritual, and sometimes physical damage. Um, Anyway, so there's that one. Uh, The next one is the BYU release form. This is a big one. Look at this. This is the release form that Dr. Uh, Eugene Thorne, who was hired by BYU, I believe, in 1969 and was running most of these studies through the 70s. Again, during Elder Oak's time as BYU president. And by the way, it should be noted, anytime you go look at BYU's board, the board is made up primarily of other church leaders, including a member of the first presidency. So while Elder Oaks is kind of caught with his foot in his mouth in this instance, it ought to be noted that there are several church leaders on the BYU board at that time. I don't know who they were. I should have looked that up before we started this this episode. But there's no doubt that there are other church leaders who were also complicit and knew what was going on. Um, Any thoughts from you on this release form? Yeah, where did you get it? It's page 95 of some book. Is that right? Um, Let's see here. This is from a website, uh, conalodonovan.com slash images slash McBride release form. I I don't know where this comes from. I just know that this is it. Can we move our pictures over to yep, the I, side yeah, so I can, I can yep, read the rest of this? Perfect, right I'm there. seeing it for the first time. If you could, we could blow it up. Can we make that a little bigger, Maven? To me, this is yeah. crazy. So, well, this is the natural thing. I mean, this is what you would do when you're doing uh, an experiment of this type with human yeah. subjects is you want to get a waiver, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the lawyers. But yeah, you want to get a waiver. But it's very interesting what it is that's said in here and what is not said, what's only implied. And I don't think it ever talks about, at least I haven't seen it so far, homosexuality. It just talks about uh, that this therapy is used, this aversion technique used to counter condition inappropriate emotional propensities like those of my own. And so the person... Tissue or organ damage? Which organ, by the way, RFM? Well, tissue or, or organ damage, you know, like there, I don't know. It, the, the, what it gets me about this, though, is that last little section. If you'll scroll down a little bit, Maven. Um, finally, I released Dr. D. Eugene Thorne. It's important that we note his name because as we go throughout this, we'll recognize that it's Dr. Thorne who's carrying this stuff out. And again, I don't think he's hired until 1969. And as we'll point out further, it is obvious and demonstrable that these studies took place in the 70s while Elder Oaks was there, but at least needs to be noted that this isn't a doctor from long before Oaks. It's during his time. Right. Can I say something here about the middle paragraph? Because this is where they're talking about the pornography that they're going to be showing the subjects. They're going to be showing female nudes and uh, hopefully getting a good response. And by this, I'm not going from the anecdotal evidence. I'm just going from the actual Uh, report the thesis that was done by doctor or a graduate student named McBride, I believe it is, which was published in 1976. But yeah, they're showing nudes of women to basically a cohort of, I think, 14 uh, men. And they're also showing nudes of males. And they have attached to the penis the penile plethysmograph, which is there to detect any kind of uh, motion or erection or swelling, right? It's yeah. what we used to call in the business, the Peter meter. Yeah. And the only reason I say that is because it's very commonly used, or at least it used to be used in doing uh, sexual deviancy evaluations to see if uh, people are having a physical sexual reaction to seeing pictures of unclad children. Yeah. So yep. they're, they're using the same kind of technique with adult women and adult men, because obviously they're viewing this homosexuality as being a perversion and something that needs to be corrected and detected. By the way, at the end is very interesting, too, because it says, finally, I released Dr. D. Eugene Thorne and his clinical associates from all legal liabilities that could result from treatment provided me from them. That part I get. But then it goes on, and from any communication of my case materials Mm. to other clinically oriented individuals, what Mm. is that about? I don't know. That sounds like super secret squirrel stuff. Like there's a recognition that what we're doing here is, to put it mildly, controversial 
And we don't want other clinically oriented individuals, whatever the heck that means, to know about it. Does that mean other people who are engaged in the same study? Or does it mean other people who, uh, I don't know, other doctors, other people in this field? Yeah. 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 It, it, yeah. Who are they talking to and who are those top men? Well, who are, who, what top men? Top men, right? So, <laughs> right. Um, so then, I don't know who drafted this, but it's obvious they want to keep it hush hush, which is actually an argument for Oaks not knowing about it. Okay. You don't know who drafted it? You don't think it's Curtin and McConkie? No. Well, if so, I hope they, they got better the help <laughs> since then, because this is so generic. I, it would be very difficult to enforce it, I think. Yeah. Yep. The the next one I thought was really interesting. This is Carrie P. Jenkins. This was to, in a 2011 article. I don't think we have the article handy, but Carrie P. Jenkins is the assistant to the president of BYU in 2011. And she confirmed that McBride, which we'll get to later, did study the effects of aversion therapy in the 1970s. She said the experiment was an outgrowth of the behaviorist movement. And give me a second. I'm just going to close a real quick window. Yeah, would you go ahead and close that? Because while you're closing yeah. that, Bill, yeah, I'm suddenly noticing what you're what you have the arrow pointed to in that document, and the the phrase you kept repeating over and over. I apologize for being so slow on this. It is talking about potential tissue and organ damage. Not your liver, not your no, kidneys. That is from the actual document, tissue and organ, and that's why you were asking the question, which was going over my head. Yeah. Well, what organ are they talking about? Well, yeah. what organ could they be talking about? The male it reproductive organ. reminds me of a joke organ. I heard back in the 70s. Did you hear about the streaker in church, Bill? No. They caught him by the organ. Yeah. <laughs> so I got a feeling that we're talking about the same thing, the same organ here. We, we are. Um, Carrie P. Jenkins confirmed that McBride did study the effects of aversion therapy in the 1970s. She said the experiment was an outgrowth of the behaviorist movement, which she believed that any behavior which believe, sorry, which believe that any behavior could be modified. So that's her way of acknowledging that the shock therapy happened without actually saying it. But then she says, our understanding is that most behaviorists no longer believe this is an appropriate treatment for those who are seeking change. Notice, by the way, everybody now, when they're forced to talk on it, admits that this was an unhealthy abuse of behavior. But she even goes further. She said, Quote, the BYU Counseling Center never practiced therapy that would invo involve chemical or induced vomiting. Notice here she implicitly, by saying it that way, she implicitly admits the shock therapy did happen. It's like if, I was telling you today on the phone, it's like if somebody came to URFM and said, I know you killed Gary and I know you put him inside your trunk. And you said, I have never put anybody inside my trunk. It would becomes clear by the answer that you did kill Gary because it is the most obvious thing to first say is that we didn't kill the guy. So when she ignores the fact that we're not going to talk about the shock therapy directly, we're only going to talk about it in this superficial behaviorist term. And then you, ad then you acknowledge that you never did any kind of inducing vomiting. What you are saying that's unsaid is that we did do shock therapy. Right. And can I mention something that Maven's bringing up? And it's an important point. Please. Is that there is a bit of confusion as to where the electrodes were attached. Because in the master or the doctoral dissertation by McBride published in 1976, he talks about this cohort. Once again, I think it's 14. Is that correct? 14 Four, men. 14 men. You're right. Yes. Okay. 14 men that they're doing this on. And he goes and he lays it all out and talks about either attaching electrode to uh, arm, in other words, big mass, or a leg, big muscle mass, um, and uh, having an ele a mild electric shock attached, and that the uh, the plethysmograph is the only thing that was attached to the penis. Which the is on the screen, by the way. The plethysmograph? Oh, yeah. there it is. The BYU Peter meter, which I think is a joking term added, but this is the actual oh, pat. This is the actual patent, though, for the device that measures the arousal of the penis. Got it. Okay, so the deal is this, is that there are some people who are reporting experiencing this personally, who I believe mention electrodes attached directly to their genitals. And so there's this confusion. Is this doctoral dissertation saying accurately the way it was done? Was it only done this way at any time? 
at BYU? Are these the only 14 guys who are ever subjected to this? And were there places where perhaps it was done differently with the electrode attached directly to the genitals? And that's why there's this issue and why it's so interesting to me and why it almost went over my head what you were emphasizing on, on that apparent release statement that they are saying they want the person, the subject, to sign off on releasing them from any damage that might be done to their tissue or organs. Yeah. And even if they didn't put the electrodes on the penis itself, if you're one of those people going through therapy, this aversion therapy, right? And if if you had electrodes hooked up somewhere and you had a device hooked up to your, your genitals and suddenly you see an image, some sort of arousal happens and you feel a shock, your brain may not be able to clearly pick out where you're feeling the electric shock at. It may feel at moments like it's running through parts, uh, entire parts of your body, especially since your mind is automatically connecting the fact that something is connected down there. Your brain may be giving you the message that that's where the shock is occurring. So we shouldn't dismiss any of these folks simply right. because their story doesn't clearly state that maybe the electrodes aren't hooked to their penis directly. Can I be really clear on this, Bill, since you yeah. brought it up and I think it's an excellent point? That there is no way of which I'm aware that a plethysmograph would cause any damage to the penis. And if it's just going straight according to this doctoral dissertation where electrodes are attached only to major muscle mass, that's not an organ. That's muscle mass, either in the arm or in the leg. So I think it may be potentially very revealing, this language they have in the release that you've shown us. Yeah. Uh, I want to read a couple more. I don't necessarily have websites for these. Um, here's another one. Another gay BYU state student named Randy Smith went through aversion therapy at BYU in the late 1970s, but when it failed to make him heterosexual, he was excommunicated and expelled from the school. How did they know that the that that he had not been able to be fixed, that they were able to essentially expel him from the school if somebody's not sharing correspondence, right? That's a good point, too. And this goes on the other side. They may be being super secret squirrel in that last paragraph, but if he's being kicked out of the school, and did you say excommunicated as well? Yes, he said excommunicated and expelled from the school. Okay, if he's being excommunicated from the school, obviously the information is being passed on to yeah. other people, either by uh, people doing the experiments or maybe it was self-reported. I have no way of knowing at this point, but obviously it's not a closed secret where... The doctors are doing this in the dungeon, in a laboratory, without anybody knowing. Right. Robert McQueen, uh, a gay return missionary and editor-in-chief of The Advocate, published an article on gays at BYU called The Heterosexual Solution, A Dilemma for Gay Mormons, unquote, accompanied by a very intense depiction of the shock therapy. Uh, Andrew Welch, a former Daily Utah Chronicle staff member, produced a 16-minute documentary on electric shock therapy at BYU in 1977 and early 1978. San Francisco public television station KQED helped produce the documentary, which they broadcast in July of 1978. For the documentary, Welch interviewed 40 gay men and two BYU psychologists and showed the electric shock therapy device being used at BYU. Um, another one. Uh, this is Legacies. This is a video for gay ex-Mormon men tell of their experience. By the way, Maven, this is where we're going to want to show those two clips. Um, if you want to put those, get, get those ready up on the screen, which I think you've done. And we'll show those here in just a second. Uh, four gay ex-Mormon men tell of their experiences growing up and coming out of Mormon families and about their conversion therapy attempts made by the church to change their sexual orientation. Uh, Maven, if you want to play these two, and uh, this one gentleman shares what this whole uh, aversion therapy was like. When we got into the higher voltage with the people who had been doing it longer, you could see uh, burn marks on the skin. And quite often, um, you could they would also um, throw up. Okay, and then the other one. When we got into the higher voltage with the people who had been doing it longer, you could see uh, burn marks on the skin. And quite often, when we got into the higher voltage with the people who... Do you know what happened there? I'm, I guess, I know there's two videos, Maven. Did, I think we played maybe the first one. If we could try that again.
there, uh, this legacies video, and I'll, I'll let her set that back up, but the legacies video, there are four different guys. I watched the whole thing the other day and all four of them are just sharing their experience being involved with the shock therapy. This sounds like, cause there is a comment about one of the men who operated the mach- the, the, the machinery for this. When we um, got into the higher voltage with the people, the, 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 he was gay himself and was working essentially for the school to administer this stuff. And, uh, ends up, you know, it, you know, again, being gay himself and, and comes forward and starts to talk about what it was like on the administrative side of, of all of this. So we'll try this again. And we would wait until we, we saw that they were, that they were getting aroused. And then we would, would push a button and the, and the, the voltage would go into the wire. And from the reaction that I saw them and also the muscle spasms that went on, um, I'm, I'm sure that it was painful. And then, yeah. So obviously not, not an enjoyable thing. And as you can see there, I don't know if that was a, any kind of depiction of what it was actually like, but if you had electrodes on both arms, maybe on your legs too, it, it would become reasonable that you might think your entire body's being shocked and not just your arm or your leg. Um, if that's going on, but anyway, it, it, it's an atrocious thing that was happening. Um, there's a participant in 1975, 76 BYU study, Don Harriman. We showed a thing from him earlier wrote that he experienced burns on his arms and he also noted emotional trauma. Um, Signature Books Library, they have a section called The Abominable and Detestable Crime Against Nature. They note from 1971 to 1980, BYU's president, Dallin H. Oaks, had Gerald J. Dye over the university standards office. They renamed it the Honor Code Office in 1991. So originally it was the university standards office. Dye stated that during that decade, part of the set process, quote unquote, for homosexual BYU students referred to his office for quote unquote, less serious offenses was to require that they undergo some form of therapy to remain at BYU. And in, in, in that in special cases, this included electroshock and vomiting aversion therapies. It should be noted, you know, that Oaks, is the one who has die kind of oversee this stuff. Again, he's the president of BYU elder Oaks is um, at before elder Oaks came in to be president of BYU. The, they would not let homosexual uh, public publicly admitted homosexuals into BYU. When Oaks came on board as BYU president, he changed the policy allowed homosexual students in, but once it was known that you were homosexual, you had to go through this therapy or some other process Um, to be able to stay. Right. And that's very, very interesting, that particular comment, because if you are Dr. McBride, I'm assuming he was a doctor at the time. Maybe No, he wasn't. This was part of becoming a doctor. This is how you become a doctor at BYU is doing these kinds of experiments, at least for Dr. McBride. But you've got to get subjects. You've got to get research subjects somehow. So if I'm doing aversion therapy, to in order to see if it will help people not be gay anymore, what I need is a parcel of gay people. And where are you going to find those at BYU? That's a challenge. I don't know if you could just put out an ad in the the daily universe saying, hey, we want some gay people for an experiment. Show up here at this building, at this room, at this time. Because then you're kind of outing yourself, if you know what I mean. But this makes a certain degree of sense that subjects are being produced by homosexuals at BYU students who get caught maybe in flagrante delecto, or maybe they just confess to their their university bishop. And so now we've got a source for subjects and they end up with 14 of them. So this makes a certain degree of sense that you get caught and you're given the option of either you're um, expelled from the school and other uh, problems ca- that can result from that, or you can voluntarily, Bill, <laughs> I know you're going to get to this in a bit, voluntarily submit yourself to this experimentation. And frankly, if you're a gay Mormon and all the messaging is that you're broken, you're less than, you are not approved of God and you should be gay, but something's wrong with you because this is a defect. It's a temporary condition, remember? It's something that can be repented of. You're gonna want more than anything else in the world to be straight, to have this taken off of you 
so that you can be like everybody else, that you can be accepted of God and you can get married and go to the temple and all the other things that you're told have to be done to have a righteous and happy life as a Latter-day Saint. So I could see people who are gay with that mindset being made aware of this and wanting to submit themselves to it. And in fact, the degree of injuries that are described by that individual, I'm sure they're not across the board, but if you are trying to get the gay out, almost like you're trying to exercise a demon from you, and it's not working with the lower voltages, then what are you going to do except increase those voltages and the frequency in hope of finally achieving success and being made straight? Yeah, yeah. And uh, it should be noted, this may not have been during Oak's time, but certainly at some point, BYU used to send out people to um, to to go and like hang out by the gay bar, to go and infiltrate. Yeah, you'll see that. Those Infiltr- are all during Oak's time. Yeah, there you go. 78, 78, 78 oh, excuse me, November 78, December 78, and January 79, all under President Oak's. He was president there from 1971 to 1980. Go ahead. Yeah, just that they had essentially spied on the LGBT community, tried to find the the gay students, and tried to make life really difficult on them. What is it you're showing for when people listen to this on audio? So Maven put this up, but this is three uh, newspaper ads from the gay underground. So this is BYU, somebody on the gay underground trying to essentially reach out and make connections with people uh, who are uh, LGBT students, you know, at, at so the school th- to be so supportive to... in some way, right? To create a community. Okay, so this is a fake. What yeah, I don't, I don't know that. And I don't know if that's what, I don't know. Maven, do you mind coming on with at least your voice? And do you know what these are? I'm pretty sure that this is a fake fishing expedition to try and lure the closet gays at BYU out into the open. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know that for sure. Maven, are you there? Hello, Maven? That's okay. That's okay. We can Yeah, that's what these are cuz one of them they all say kind of the similar thing and can I read one just for the oh, record? Oh, please. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So, November 1978, one's published, December 1978, one's published, January 1979, one's published. And where are these published again, Bill? Oh, she's saying that these are fake, and I, I don't know, but I I don't know where these are published. But I assume it's a local off-campus newspaper or a uh, you know some type of classified ads or something. Okay, and they're Personal all similar, ads. but I'll just read the last one. Okay, BYU Please. Gay Underground is all in caps. Okay, that should get the attention, right? Person interested in meeting other gays going to BYU. Oh, so this is like in the personals. Yeah. All correspondence will go through the open door, which is capitalized, the open door, for safety reasons. Write the open door number 1004. So, of course, they present it as being something that's going to be, um, well, dodgy to respond to this. And it recognizes the dodginess. So go ahead and contact me through the open door number 1004 send the mail there and then once we get it then we will start trying to establish a relationship with you where we can meet face to face and then we've got you this is just like a sting operation that police do even now where they will have an adult posing as a 14 year old girl on maybe craigslist or some other place like that and they'll post an ad they'll lure somebody in They'll start a relationship or excuse me, start a um, oh, email or texting relationship, maybe phone calls. And the idea is to lure this person and get them to come to a park where they're going to meet up with this hot little 14 year old. And then they show up and then they bust them. That's the same kind of thing going on here. Yeah. In fact, I was while you were talking, I, I looked this up. So in S- September of 1979, BYU officials admitted to reporters that camp again, BYU officials, 1979 admitted to reporters that campus security had staked out bars in Salt Lake City to investigate homosexual activity at the Mormon-owned schools. A Mormon-owned school. Paul Richards, director of public relations for the university, confirmed that security officers had ventured off campus and had written letters to the Salt Lake gay newspaper, 
quote, the open door, unquote, soliciting responses as part of a crackdown on homosexuals. He claimed, quote, those things were done, but when President Oaks got involved, he said, cut that out right now, unquote. BYU security chief Robert Kelshaw also admitted that BYU detective had written an unauthorized gay underground letter to the open door in an attempt to entrap homosexuals attending BYU. Now, the question becomes whether Elder Oaks knew earlier and only once it hits the newspaper and the press, does he say, like, knock that stuff off, let's quit. Because I think the church has a long history of doing that kind of thing. Well, this is the exact kind of thing that they did with the meetings at, I think, stake centers or other large venues for uh, mostly women, forgive the sexism, but people who were attending conferences in support of the Equal Rights Amendment in the 1970s is that they would have people go by and write down the license plate numbers, which they could then run through their, uh, the friends that they had with the local police, find out who they belong to and get tabs on these people so they could forward that information to their local bishop. Yeah. And people were, you know, there's, we've been using the words, these were fake. It's not that they were fake. These, it wasn't a real gay person wanting to meet other gay people. It was the school putting out ads portraying themselves as a gay person trying to meet other gay people and was using it to entrap uh, gay uh, students at the school to catch them essentially red-handed and be able to then uh, figure out something else to do with them to either get them out of the school or force them into these therapies. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So I want to get to these last two things. And these are the two smoking guns for me. And I, I want to let you talk about the first one. You've been mentioning this Mr. McBride fellow the whole time. Uh, Maven, if you'll put the McBride stuff up and um, uh, will you go to the other one first? Yep. Let's do. There's tissue or organ I, I damage that in might the be release there. Again. Is that it? No. Um, and this is the um, the dissertation that was done based upon experimentation upon 14 men published in 1976 at BYU by McBride, who was conducting these experiments in order to see if yeah, you that's could it. shock, if you could uh, give negative consequences, in other words, shocking people yeah. in order to make them not be gay anymore. Yeah. So tell us, tell us about this McBride guy and what, what this is. Cause you see this as the smoking gun, um, that they, they essentially published their research on these experiments. Right. And the first thing is that this happens in 1976 when it is published. Yeah. Once again, Elder Oaks being president from 1971 to 1980, this happens square in the middle of it. Now, typically one would think that the research that is reported in the dissertation probably happened within one or two years at the outside from the publication of the dissertation. For Elder Oaks to be correct in his allegation that all electroshock conversion therapy was abandoned before he became president in 1971 would require any of these or all of these experiments talked about in this dissertation to have happened more than five years before the publication of the dissertation, right? It's published in 1976. And since President Oaks became president in 1971 of BYU, it would have had to have been more than five years before that for him to be telling the truth. This sounds very unlikely. And yet the smoking gun is contained on page 51 of the dissertation itself. That's the smoking gun. Do you have that there? Is that page 51? Are you doing that there, Bill? That's 41. Yeah. And I wanted to ask how it was that you found this, Bill, because you pointed it out to me and I said, boom, case closed. I know you got, you're trying to pay, find page 51. But yeah, somebody somebody on a Reddit forum somewhere um, made mention that this particular section of this document really holds Elder Oak's feet to the fire. And so I had shared it with you because you already knew the document wasn't essentially a smoking gun. The only argument could be that they're publishing the research in the mid-70s, but that the experiments had been done in the late 60s. 
And that argument would hold water if it wasn't for page 51, which completely closes the door on that because they have updated their research after 1974 with new data from these shock therapies that happened before the thing was published, but after the year 1974. Right. So I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, It's very brief, but basically they're saying how it was they, they came up with the formulation of the experiments that they followed. And what they say is we followed a program or an assertion training program that was developed by two other scientists, but it gives the year of the publication that these scientists published this and it's 1974. So it says to facilitate normal heterosexual role adjustment, all, and that's a capital S, little s, which I think is probably subjects, to facilitate normal heterosexual role adjustment, that means shocking them to be gay, all subjects were involved in assertion training, okay? The procedure followed was a modification of an assertion training program developed by Flowers and Guerra in 1974. So what that says is even though the assertion training component was probably different than the electroshock therapy component, what they're saying is, is that they were following a training program that was developed and published in 1974. So how could they be following a training program that was published in 1974 in this study if they had done it before 1974? Right, right. So this is for all effect, uh, the smoking gun, because it pinpoints a very small period of time. And all of that time is during Elder Oaks reign as BYU president. Right. And maximum is from 1974 at some point when this was published. It just gives the year to the date that this the this dissertation by McBride was published in 1976. By the way, do you have the the cover page to this? Um, Will you go all the way back up to the top, Maven? Because I would like the audience to be able to see the cover page. That's information. Go down a little more right here. And maybe well, there. um, Can you go down a little bit further? That's where you find it. There you go. Thank you. So if you can read the um the title, which is at the top, which I can't read quite go up right a little now. More, go up a little more. There we go. So, Effect, if, yeah, so go it's ahead. titled Effect of Visual Stimuli in Electric Aversion Therapy. By the way, that's the name of the study. In Electric Aversion Therapy. And the visual stimuli is the, the pornographic. Well, that's probably what the church would say. Let's say nude images, right? It's a dissertation presented to the Department of Psychology, Brigham Young University, in partial fulfillment of the requirements for the degree Doctor of Philosophy. Is there more on that cover page, Maven? By Max Ford McBride. That's Max, the first name, Ford, the middle name, McBride, August 1976. Yeah. So So that, coupled with page 51, is a smoking gun that this happened, this uh, shock therapy with these 14 subjects happened between 1974 and August of 1976 when it was published. It most definitely, absolutely happened while President Oaks was the president of BYU. Yeah, and um, we'll use the criterion of embarrassment here, but if we pull up that fair Mormon one as well, Maven. um... Because fair Mormon has apparently weighed in on this question. Yeah, we saw how they handled Kane. Uh, they do a little better maybe on this one, but not by much. So um, so they asked, uh, the questions asked, what was the history of BYU in aversion therapy for treating homosexuality? Notice there a little quick blip. In the mid-1970s, a graduate student, Max McBride, conducted a study entitled Effective Visual Stimuli and Electric Aversion Therapy. Again, I hate the way they choose their words, but they don't want to tell you that he actually did the uh, electric aversion therapy, only that he conducted a study. In the, in the mid-1970s, a graduate student, Max McBride, conducted a study entitled Effect of Visual Stimuli and Electric Aversion Therapy. It appears that the study was conducted during the 1974 and 1975 with the average length of treatment during the study being three months. By there the was, way, yeah, they came to the same conclusion, and I'll bet it's based on page 51 as well, that this happened between 74 and 75. Yeah, the results of this study were published in August of 1976 as McBride's PhD dissertation in the BYU Department of Psychology. 
Uh, McBride's research has recently been sensationalized, blah, blah, blah. They just go on. Um, claims have made about his study and they go on to dispute various facts of it, but at least understand that fair Mormon, the church's uh, apologetic arm is acknowledging that during elder Oaks time as BYU president, the BYU did electric aversion therapy. And that is the key. That is the point we're driving at because when fair, by the way, are you getting this off their website right now? Yep. That's off their website right now. They haven't changed it yet. Well, they need to get on the, 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 the job because Right now, that paragraph is showing that President Oaks told a something that wasn't true on November 12th at the University of Virginia. He yeah. was dissembling. And by the way, here's the other thing that's really important. It is conceivable that Elder Oaks at his advanced age may have not remembered that this was going on while he was the president of BYU. I find it hard to believe, but we could extend him that much charity. Maybe it's true. Maybe he just forgot it, even though he says, hey, I want you to know it was abandoned. <laughs> it was abandoned before I became president. And this is now let's just set that to one side. So, you know, I'm done with this issue. Let's go on to this other point where I say different things to different audiences, even if they seem to be mutually contradictory. That is something that is possible, but... But he was given, President Oaks was given the opportunity to correct the record after this answer was given by him on November 12th. And he was given that opportunity by the Salt Lake Tribune, who asked about it. So after reflection, after being able to do whatever research he needed to search uh, the, the records to have people. I mean, he has people who can research. This and let me stop you for just a second. Cause I want you yeah. to do that, but I yeah. want to put that up on the screen. I, I have a subscription to the Salt Lake Tribune and uh, Maven, do you have that Salt Lake Tribune article so that RFM? Yeah, this is, I think it's from uh, November 16th. I think it's from four days later, but that would be at the top of the article, but this is what happened. Now, after he's given several days, to consider it, to have people do research, to figure out that, yeah, it really did happen. And yes, he really did misrepresent things badly at the University of Virginia. This is what happens. This is from the Salt Lake Tribune article. And I think it's uh, the 16th of November, several days later, regardless. Oaks, it says, Oaks declined to comment on the discrepancy between his memory and the research. Church spokesman Doug Anderson said Monday. So first off, President Oaks is not even going to respond personally himself. He's going to run it through the PR guy. And apparently what Doug Anderson says, at least the way he's quoted in this article, is that Elder Oaks declined to comment. First off, no comment from Elder Oaks on the discrepancy between his memory and the research. In other words, his memory is wrong because his memory is different from the research that much has become clear to everybody by this point. So given the chance to correct the record, to say, I made a mistake. Uh, I just forgot about it. And let's be honest here about what really happened and what didn't elder Oaks says no comment. He will not, uh, he will not take the opportunity given him to correct the record. And well, I almost said to apologize, but we know that's never going to happen. So he to correct the record. So the church representative then pointed to the faith's 2016 public statement reinforced several years later about so-called conversion therapy. And the church's statement in 2016 is the church denounces any therapy, including conversion and reparative therapies that subjects an individual to abusive practices, not only in Utah, but throughout the world. So here's what's going on here. Two things. First, this reminds me of John Taylor back when he was over there in, I think it was France and having a debate and he was challenged by ministers about the practice of polygamy that they'd heard the Mormons were doing over there in Utah. And remember this because you brought it up on an earlier episode where elder John Taylor says, no, we're not practicing any polygamy. Of course he had multiple wives at that time. So he knew perfectly well they were practicing polygamy, but what he does is look, he tries to shine it on. No, he doesn't. He doesn't make an outright denial. He says, I can't even believe that you'd be asking me such a horrible question to think that we'd be doing anything that bad. 
The best I can do, he says, is to refer you to section 101 in the Doctrine and Covenants, which I think is verse five. We don't have it anymore. But it's the one that says that the church believes that marriage should be only between one man and one woman. So what John Taylor was doing at the time was he was taking a situation where he knew that the allegation was true, that they were practicing polygamy. He was practicing polygamy himself, but he doesn't answer the question. And as a way of answering it, he goes to a document that had been published in the 1830s, which he knew did not reflect what was going on today as the, as of the time he was speaking. So here we have the church spokesman saying, okay, I'm going to refer you to this document from 2016, which is in the present tense, right? It doesn't talk about anything in the past. Can we get that up there again, Maven? That quote from the Tribune. So what it does is, yeah, it says the church denounces, notice the present tense, any therapy, including conversion and reparative therapies that subjects, again, present tense, an individual to abusive practices. By the way, that makes it subjective and you get to determine what's abusive and what's not, right? Not only in Utah, but throughout the world. So they are taking a present tense denouncing of that kind of therapy. And they're wanting the audience to believe that it applies retroactively when by its very terms, it does not. By the way, this is the cross reference between John Taylor and Elder Holland. Because in that BBC interview, he tried to pull the same trick with the uh, Michael Sweeney, the reporter, when he was asking Elder Holland if Mitt Romney had taken the blood oaths in the temple when Mitt Romney went through his endowment. You remember what Elder Holland said. He said, there are no penalties in the temple endowment. He's yeah. playing the same game. He's saying the present tense, knowing that it doesn't apply retroactively, but hoping it will be believed to be applied retroactively. But he was disappointed in that because Michael Sweeney followed up and he said, but they were. And immediately Elder Holland cracks like a nut and says, yes, yes, they were. And then Sweeney follows up again. So Mitt Romney would have taken those when he went through the temple. And Elder Holland has to agree. Yes, because he was caught out. So I see this as being both of those things happening at this time in an attempt to deceive the audience in an attempt to not deal with the issue or take responsibility for what happened. Yeah. And so wrapping up here, I just want to state a couple of um, official things that the church has said. So on the church's newsroom, they have a section, a page that says church continues to oppose conversion therapy. I don't like that wording because it's as if they always have. They might be continuing today from yesterday or maybe yesterday from 2018, but even as recent as 2017, uh, there was a uh, reparative therapy uh, meeting that was going to happen. Let me see if I can pull this up really quick. Um, and please I mean, note I, that according to their own terms, and if you're going to try and find it, I was going to try and cover a little time. Is that okay, Bill? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I can just skip doing that. It's okay. Um, but there, there, as early as, or as recent as 2017, there was an attempt at one of the BYU, BYU schools, it might have been Idaho, where the church tried to have some other group come in and uh, like Evergreen or something and do some kind of thing about uh, reparative therapy or reversion therapies. And the church got so much flack about it, it had to cancel it on the spot and it ended up not happening. So as recent as 2017, they've tried to get some of this stuff to go on, but they have spoken officially the church newsroom. Again, church continues to oppose conversion therapy, LDS family services, uh, quote LDS. I'm sorry, quote family services has a longstanding express policy against using therapies that seek to repair, convert, or change sexual attraction, a uh, sexual orientation, sorry, such as, from homosexual to heterosexual. First Presidency has stated recently, the church denounces any therapy that subjects an individual to abusive practices. Um, just to note that the church is very clear now that it is against all of these therapies that Elder Oaks seemed to be for before he was against it. Yes, and please notice the use of that word abusive. Yeah. Because what they're saying it's is... Objective. Yeah, what they're saying is, number one, they're still uh, in favor, or at least not against any kind of conversion therapy, which they themselves do not deem to be abusive. And yeah. I would bet that if you were able to, or I were able to hold Elder Oaks feet to the fire, that is where he would go 
which is he would say that in his opinion, the electroshock therapy that happened in the 1970s was not abusive. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so now I want to kind of wrap this up and then we can move to some phone calls so we can get to our victory for Satan segment mm. of the of the show. People can call 662 Mormons or 662 667 Mark of the Beast 666 and then another 7 to wrap it up, but it is again 662 Mormons. Uh, you can help us get a victory for Satan and we'll get some calls in the queue. We already have Nicola there waiting. Nicola, be patient. Can I, Please go ahead. Can I, have five, can I have five minutes to rant? Yeah, please. I'm so sorry. And I'll try and keep it to five minutes because there's this whole 30 some odd minute lecture that he gives that evening, which we haven't even touched upon. And I was watching this and it was very difficult to get through because it's a general authority talking about the law. So it's going to be doubly boring. And it is. It's doubly boring. And I was just so struck the first time I listened to it because I thought, what on earth is he getting at? Why is he saying these things? It was a spectacle to have a seasoned lawyer and a former justice on the U Utah Supreme Court coming in and saying, we shouldn't go to court over this. He actually disses the entire court system as an effective means for settling disputes because he wants to say, well, we just need to all get along and stay out of the court system. That was my first impression. I thought, why is he doing this? And then I listened to it again. I printed it off. I read it. I marked it up. It's right here. And I just wanted to say a few things because I think I know what he's doing. Here's the deal. It is an extreme step, first off, for a general authority to actually say something that is demonstrably untrue in black and white terms. All right. I think they're much better at equivocating. So they've got some out say, oh, well, that doesn't mean that, or I didn't mean that if, they're, if they ever get called on it. This is an out and out prevarication. Yeah. Is that a nice way to put it? And then he and then he doubles down on it. He doesn't correct it, which tells me not just that he's uh, out there saying things that aren't true, but that it's very important to him that this untruth stand and not be corrected. OK, and I think, well, why is that so important to him? If you look at the entire context of the talk, he says this is the most difficult talk he's ever attempted. Do you remember that? Mm hmm. OK, and I'm not we're not going to play clips and I'm not going to read quotes from the talk. Please go look at it if you want to. I don't want it to get in the way of my rant, but uh, it's all there. So this is the most difficult talk he's ever attempted. And the reason why is because he has all this baggage. He knows he has all this baggage. It's his baggage and it's gone back for decades. And now he's going to try and remake himself and present himself to this audience. Not as an attorney, by the way. He says, I'm not talking to you as an attorney today, but I am talking to you in my role as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember that part? No, but no, this is yeah. where he goes full on endowment. Because I know that when he says that, the first thing I think of and the first thing he's thinking of is when Peter, James and John, who have been sort of traveling mm. incognito around the Garden of Eden, are instructed by Elohim to go down to the Garden of Eden and reveal yourself to Adam and Eve in your true character as apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are true messengers. Yes, exactly. So now they're revealed. And this is what Elder Oaks is doing. He's doing the big reveal. I'm not here talking as a lawyer who happens to be an apostle. I'm talking to you as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And as his apostle, Jesus Christ was all about peace and getting along. Well, that's not happening in court. So I'm here to bring this message of peace to you. After decades of being in the trenches fighting against this opposition, as he sees it with, uh, let's say, the, the, the gay lobby, if I can use that expression, the people are fighting with all these battles. And losing over and over and over again. Now he wants to try and say, well, I'm not coming here as a lawyer. I'm coming here as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And the reason why is because they've get, been getting their ass kicked in court. They being the church and other people who've been fighting against these, even as recently as I think just last year, there was another significant loss that they suffered where they had filed an amicus curiae brief along with other uh, similarly minded religions at the United States Supreme Court. We don't have time to get into the details of that. But it is critical to him coming in and saying, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, saying we need to live in peace together to not have 
this baggage brought up. Yeah. If the baggage gets brought up, his cover is blown. Mm. So that's why I think it is that he has to, or he feels he has to come in and say, no, it was never done under my administration. Okay. By the way, by the way, that answer is wholly unsatisfactory because what he's doing at that point is he's talking as a former president of the university and saying this happened before I was the president of the university. Well, we know that's incorrect, but even if it had been true, he's there at the university of Virginia, not as a president of the university, he's there as an apostle of Jesus Christ representing the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which he has just admitted was conducting this very kind of experimentation at BYU, even though he says it was prior to his being president there. So in the larger picture, it doesn't make any difference when he was the president. If he's admitting it to it happening at BYU, then he represents the church that was doing it. And so he should be there making some kind of an explanation or at least an apology. I know it's not in his vocabulary. Apparently the word is not in the, the standard works. So that's it. But with all this baggage coming in, what he doesn't want the audience to know is that this is the equivalent of having Joseph Mengele talk about ethics in medicine. That's what's going on here. That's what he is. And he knows it to some extent. And his cover gets blown because students there at the University of Virginia knew about his background and they cobbled together this question to have it asked specifically to him so that he could not sail in there under a false flag, which is what I believe he was doing. This idea of a false flag operation, right? It comes, I think, from the pirates. Pirates were, you know, they want to prey on other ships. And the best way to do it is not to have the Jolly Roger up there on your mast. You fly up uh, a friendly flag and it's a false flag. And you do it so that you can get close enough to the other side in order to destroy them and take them captive. Captive. So that's one thing. Okay, sorry. One other thing is this, is that this, this whole speech is, Elder Oak saying, please, please stop kicking our ass in court. That's what this whole talk is. And so he can't say that. So he comes in like an apostle saying, I'm above the fray and I'm talking to you two warring groups and I want you to get along. Don't go to court anymore because Jesus doesn't like that. That's not the way we promote peace. He's the Prince of Peace. I'm his representative, right? So don't do that anymore. Let's just go to legislation and good faith negotiation. Let's just do that because historically the church has done much better with the legislation than they have in the courts as witness prop eight. That was 2008 in California. The church was able to use its resources in order to get a majority of the people in California to vote for a resolution that said that marriage was defined as only between one man and one woman. And that passed that made it into law until it got appealed to, I think, the first federal judge who struck it down and said that's not constitutional. So that in a microcosm is showing how the church does better with legislation than it does in the court system. So, of course, they don't want to be in the court system anymore. They just want to do the legislation. And this is one of the reasons why I see this as an extremely cynical talk on the part of Elder Oaks. I will tell you that my big brother is five years older than I am. There's another intermediate brother, but I'm, I'm the baby in the family. And believe me, I grew up getting my ass regularly kicked by my big brother because that's sort of the nature of things. Then I start growing up. I become 15, 16, 17. I start getting taller than my big brother. I start filling out and I start getting stronger than my big brother. And much to my delight, things start changing. And I'm the one who's kicking his ass when he starts a fight. And believe mm -hmm. it or not, Bill, believe it or not, after that happened, my brother didn't want to fight me anymore. Mm. I know that sounds incredible, but yeah. he didn't want to fight me anymore. And I see the exact same thing going on here, that they've been getting their ass kicked in court. So, of course, they don't want to go to court anymore. And that's why Elder Oaks comes in as an apostle. Now, the irony here, and I'll, I'll leave this here, okay? The irony is that he wants to appear that he has clean hands and he comes in as an apostle. And that's why he has to tell this whopper in the Q&A session. The irony is, is that it's because he's speaking as an apostle of Jesus Christ that he feels compelled to lie. That's the irony, I think. Yeah. Mm. And again, you could plead memory, forgetfulness, 
I thought it was earlier in my time as the president that I got rid of that, you know, but then he's given a chance to correct the record and he doesn't. Right. Because it's that important to him. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than get it right, rather than be honest. He loses all moral authority to make his presentation as an apostle of Jesus Christ to enjoin peace upon both sides. If the truth about his background is public. And, and maybe he has as much blood as any, any of those top 15. There's nobody, there's nobody in the top 15 who has more promoted and behind the scenes instigated and structured all of the church's response to the gay issue, fighting against gay marriage, doing everything they can in order to reserve to them what they are pleased to now call religious freedom, which means the freedom of a church to discriminate, in this case, against gay people because they're gay. Yeah. Amen. So I got two things I want to do to wrap up and then we'll take a few phone calls. We're going just a little long tonight. I promised you, RPM, this would be a shorter show and we didn't. What did I tell you? Through. It what never did I tell happens. You? Never happens. That's what but I told I, you. I want to bring a friend of mine onto the show. This is Michelle. Michelle, how are you doing today? Hello. So good. How are you guys? Awesome. Hi, Mich hi Michelle. Mich can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. You, Michelle and I worked together at Family Pond in Hurricane, Utah. Mm -hmm. And Michelle, the other day, uh, told me this poem. This issue is one that she is aware of. She was aware when Elder Oak said this, and she's aware of this mm -hmm. issue. Um, and do you want to say any more than that, Michelle? Uh, not really. It's just a really funny poem. Okay. Would you mind? Uh, would you mind reading that to us? It's in. It's in the Christmas spirit too. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, with my. I'm anxious to find out what what word you. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, I want to find out what. I want to find out what word you came up with that rhymes with plethysmograph. <laughs> oh, that's... Just don't be there. That's a, don't be that's there. A tough one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's a it's a poem that I found from Ex Mormon Snippets on Instagram. All right. So this is it. Every who down in Whoville, every who down in Whoville liked queer folks a lot, but the Oaks who lived just north of Whoville did not. The Oaks hated the gays, the whole LGBT spectrum. Now, please don't ask why it has to do with the rectum. Or it could be perhaps that his garments were too tight, or maybe his days never went just quite right. But I think the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. But whatever the reason, his heart or his days, he stood at the pulpit hating the gays, staring down from his mic with a lawyer-faced frown at the warm, loving couples below in their town. For he knew the gays only had two goals, destroy the family unit and use the wrong hole. <laughs> Michelle, thank you very much. Thank you for being a part of Mormonism Live tonight. Yeah. Bravo. You. Bravo. Ha You're have, an, have an awesome day. You too. Thank you. All right. So, RFM, with that, I also wanted to finish off with something Joanna Brooks said in 2016 when the church finally took a uh, outspoken approach to rejecting the conversion therapy. Here's what she said. She said, I am so grateful that the church has spoken out to definitively reject conversion therapy. I hope it will bring relief to LGBT people and their families and put an end to conversion therapy in our communities. Many generations of gay LDS people have been subjected to cruel, harmful, physical, emotional, and religious treatments that purported to change them from gay to straight and bring them closer to God. Some have undergone extreme treatments, including electroshock therapy at church-owned Brigham Young University. Others have been told by their local church leaders that extreme self-deprivation, prayer, and scripture study would fix them. Generations of gay Latter-day Saint people deserve our apology. But it is not enough to reject abusive conversion therapy. We must also reject any suggestion that LGBT people are not created in the image of God as an expression of the beauty and diversity of God's creation. As long as Mormons believe that being gay disqualifies anyone from enjoying all the blessings God has to offer, the foundational harmful logic of conversion therapy remains at work among us. So that's Joanna Brooks. And that's all I've got. Elder Oaks absolutely was there when it happened. He absolutely had to have known about it. There's too many implications for not. 
And he, he wants to play this card of, again, as you pointed out, be nice. And we're past that. I got rid of that, but he has been the advocate all along the way to maintain the church's theology that excludes practicing, uh, homosexuals from the celestial kingdom. Yes. And in closing, in closing, closing before the phone call, sorry about this. There was this quote that I did see that I sent to you. Uh, and I forget who gave it, but it was talking about science and religion. And it applies perfectly to what's going on with Elder Oaks in his talk and talking about my my big brother and how it was when I got big enough to beat him up. He suddenly didn't want to fight anymore. Do you have that one? It's against a black background. It's white lettering and it has a picture of a gentleman on the side. There it is. Can you get us on? There you go. Thank you, Maven. That's where it says. Um, and who is this? If we could. Okay. Yeah. Robert G. Ingersoll. Sorry. Not sure who that is. Probably somebody famous, but uh, what he says is absolutely brilliant. There is no harmony between religion and science. Robert Ingersoll writes when science was a child, religion sought to strangle it in the cradle. Now that science has attained its youth and superstition, that's how he characterizes religion and superstition is in its dotage. The trembling, palsied wreck of religion says to the athlete, let us be friends. Yeah. Your younger brother or your older brother wanted to start being nice to you, didn't he? Yeah. Let's not fight so much. This is exactly what was going on, in my opinion, with with Elder Oaks' talk at the University of Virginia, November 12, 2021. Uh, He has been getting his tush kicked, and the church has been getting beaten and beaten and beaten in court. So now what he says is, hey, let's be friends. Yeah. And and Maven, if you want to put that last little video clip up, I do want to show that. So John DeLynn in the Open Stories Foundation just recently had a uh, uh, a conversation about the same thing. And I want to play a little segment here that was on his show where the gentleman says something. So uh, go ahead with that, uh, Maven. Un- unmute your thing. We're not broken. Electric shock therapy was about fixing our brokenness. And we weren't broken to begin with. And instead, they took these beautiful people and broke them. Yeah. Yeah. That's Uh, very, very moving. I'm glad you played that, Bill. That reminds me of one other thing, though, which is really important. I know we're trying to pack in everything they got in like six hours and Mormon stories in one hour here. And it's a little bit over one hour. And I apologize for that. But this is very important that I think it was that gentleman who was speaking. Is that uh, was it O'Donnell Sullivan or so? I'm so sorry. I I apologize for not remembering his name. But uh, I think that was the gentleman who was speaking who found this dissertation by Max Ford McBride from 1976 because he went to BYU to find it. He knew it was there because there's a title saying it had been done, but he could not find the dissertation itself. He looked everywhere he possibly could, including the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress was missing its copy of this dissertation as well. Hmm. And finally, he took action by, I believe it was writing a letter saying, look, the law is that you have to keep copies of every dissertation you do at your university as part of keeping your accreditation. And you've gotten rid of this somehow. I can't find it. And unless you produce the dissertation to me and its completeness, I'm going to have to be contacting the appropriate people so they can evaluate whether you should remain an accredited university. And as soon as that happened, he got a copy of the dissertation, which is why we have it tonight, but it is apparent that efforts had been taken both at BYU as well as at the Library of Congress to get rid of every copy of this dissertation in existence. Why is Elder Oaks allowed to be deceptive and dishonest and lie, but you and I are not allowed to criticize leaders even if the criticism is true? And when you recognize that that relationship between church leaders in members or ex-members who who at one time at least felt passionately about this church and who want to raise a voice to its unhealthiness, you realize that that relationship has privilege only going one direction. 
and uh, that's an unbalanced, unhealthy relationship. Um, let's go to a couple of callers. Nicola, uh, you are on the air. I'm hoping that the, they'll be able to hear you here. Nicola, are you there? Yes. RFM, could you hear Nicola? No. No. Let me try something. Uh, Bless her heart. I think she lives in England and she's been waiting all this time. It's going to yeah. be about three Give in the morning there. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to try... Let's try that. Nicola, let's try it again. See if, um, say something. Hi. Okay. He can hear you now. So okay. Nicola, RFM won't be able to hear, okay. or you won't be able to hear RFM again. Cause we've got a little glitch with my roadcaster, but okay. he'll be able to hear you. So what, what's your thoughts on tonight's okay. show, my friend? Well, brilliant as normal, but obviously, I mean, I heard about this before, but some guy told me that was gay that it wasn't just the mormons that participated in this it was other churches across america and if that's true they should be held accountable too because this is absolutely appalling if other christian religions did it because it's just like prop eight the mormons did it but other christian uh churches did that too and they all need to be accountable because it's not fair that it's just not it's, i don't care i know people say life isn't fair but it should be, as far as religion is concerned. You don't go to join a church to have them be unethical. Like, m most businesses have ethical things. This isn't unethical. It's it's absolutely monstrous that they've done it. Yeah. And everybody should, every single person should be held accountable for whatever they've, they've done. And also, you don't get, I mean, we never hear what what effect that had on those people that were doing these things because lots yeah. of things in the church that you're done like i know things have happened through bishops where they've carried out orders and stuff and it hasn't gone really well and those things have uh been things that the bishops have uh basically suffered from because they've they've been obedient to the things and all we've heard about is obviously he shouldn't be lying because that's not what we were told. And it also, we meant to be kind to one another, because in primary, it doesn't say, uh, it, it will be taught the song to be kind to one another. And kindness begins with us. And somewhere along the line, these people don't follow what they've taught us all this time to do. No, they didn't say, they don't. oh, we'll be nasty to the people. Yeah. I'm going to hang up with you, but I'll respond to that. And RFM will respond to that off the air, okay? Or, or off all right, the call. Thank, thank, you. thank you. All right. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So other churches did do this. Other religions did do these same things. Um, none of those were the true and living church upon the earth. None of those are led by prophets, seers, and revelators who speak directly to God. They absolutely should also get the same sort of criticism and um, deserved judgment and um, uh, fallback. Yeah, well, consequences and fallback for whatever that means for them. I'm, I used to be Mormon, and so I only care about, in this instance, the Mormon approach and the, the damage Elder Oaks is doing to my community. Um, it should be noted that Mormonism sets itself apart as different than those other churches. It is the one true and living church with people at the top who speak directly to God. God is either okay with this or they don't really speak to him. Right. Like, that's the argument. And uh, Elder Oaks, uh, for all of his uh, horrible, antics in this issue uh we're just not going to let him off the hook and pretend like he's been the good guy all along no i think it's very important to do this episode and to make it absolutely crystal clear that he was prevaricating when he gave that answer and definitely prevaricating when he refused to correct the record yeah i think that's very very important because uh this is something that was done in a handheld video because it wasn't being professionally recorded. It wasn't supposed to get out. I have no idea what Elder Oaks was thinking, subjecting himself to being asked a question or random questions from the audience. I don't know if he thought he had that controlled or handled or the questions lined up, but it blew up and it needs to be public. And I don't think it can be talked about enough. By the way, this is on a much lesser note. On his right, as we're looking at him in the screen, there's Kathleen Flake is the lady to, it's his left, but our right on the stage. The guy on the left is Douglas Laycock. 
who is uh, the head of the religious legal department. He's an expert in law as it relates to religion. Uh, it was very interesting for me to see him and to recollect when I saw that the name sounded familiar, that that's one of my old professors from the University of Texas at Austin, Douglas Laycock. Yeah, interesting. Cool. Um, our next caller is, uh, I believe it's Katie. Katie, is that the name? Hello? Yeah. yeah, okay. Katie, you're on the air, Mormonism Live with Radio Free Mormon. And Bill Real, what's uh, your thoughts on tonight? Yeah, um, I just was thinking about um, RFM's point about how the church is always talking in present tense to kind of avoid or um, put shade over the past, um, especially in these news articles. And um, yesterday I saw an article in the Deseret News that really shocked me about um, about David Archuleta. I don't know if you guys saw that, but they did an interview with him and about just his sexuality and how he's doing and how he stays faithful and in in a YouTube interview he, he had done earlier this year, he had told he had um, told the interviewer that a general authority had told him that the law of chastity was the same for um, gay people as it was for straight people. That um, as as long as you're you know not having sex before marriage and that sort of stuff, then you're, you're keeping the law of chastity. It's the same for you as it is for them. And, um, I thought the church is never going to get behind this, but in that interview with Deseret News, he actually says that, um, he no longer, like he keeps the law of chastity just the same, except for he no longer dates women. He dates men, and he dates them in the same non-sexual way that he dated women. And um, and then lower down in the article, the, the church policies are listed where it says same-sex attraction is not a sin as long as you don't act upon it, blah, blah, blah. And I just, the whole thing just shocked me, but also just left me feeling really upset that it just seems like they're trying to get behind this story to try and slowly change the way that it seems like they're handling it all, but they won't come out and say, like, it's okay to date this, a person of the same gender as long as you're keeping the law of chastity, <laughs> you know? Yeah. They won't say it, and but they're just going to... um just use his story to kind of promote that new way of thinking, but only a certain amount of bishops will know. And it's just kind of frustrating. That's an easy thing to do, isn't it? On the front end of life to date somebody without any sexuality, but you don't see a lot of 40 and 50 year old people in the church maintaining that, uh, that, that by choice. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, and just what like, does it all mean? Yeah, like what 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 is not not sexually dating someone like? Because he was kind of saying that like I can hold hands, I can kiss, sort of thing. Yeah, as long as I'm. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I would like to see him try that in a in an LDS congregation or at BYU. That that right. wouldn't that wouldn't go over. Like you you get it. Like, which is exactly what you're pointing out there's a double standard here in the sense of saying like, Oh, I just live the law of chastity. Well, that's all fine on the dating side of things. But when he falls in love with another man and he wants to get married, that line of thinking will have to come to some sort of end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for the call. I'm going to, I'm going to let you go. We'll, we're going to take another phone call, but appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and yes, that's a, that's a great point that you made. I'm glad that you did. The church tries to shade this as the law of chastity is the same for everybody, whether you're yeah. a homosexual or heterosexual. In other words, we're being fair. The reality is, is that if you're heterosexual, you can get married and then express yourself sexually with your spouse and still be a good Mormon. If you're gay and you get married, 
then you get excommunicated. Right. That's the difference. Right. It's not the same rules. Right. It is, it is if you are chased while dating, but the moment you want to get serious about intimacy and romance with another human being that you now love, uh, the rubber is going to meet the road. It's, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to not go well. Right. The only way that a gay person can stay in the church is, well, God forbid now they should marry a woman just because to keep up appearances, because that's what they're supposed to do. But if they're being true to their gayness, the only way they can stay in the church is to never express themselves sexually in a gay way. They can't do it before marriage. They can't do it after marriage because once they get married in a gay marriage, well, now they're in a state of apostasy. They're going to be excommunicated. So really that is, it's, it's a shell game the church is playing when they, when they say that the law of chastity is applied equally to both. Yes, that's true before marriage, but not after the heterosexuals are able to get married. Yeah. We'll take our final caller. This is Mahanri. Um, and he has, he seems to know something about those files that were missing. And so Mahanri, you're on Mormonism live. Are you there? I'm here. <laughs> Great. Would you, would yeah, you mind I'm sharing sure. with us what, uh, what you know about uh, this story? Um, I, I don't know which story you're talking about, but, uh, um, uh, cause I may, I may have missed something you just said. Earlier. Well, I, it sounds but like I, um, when, when the, the screener, you know, when Maven took the phone call, it says something about, you knew a lady oh, who worked for the university of Wyoming library. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. That's what I was going to share please. with you. Um, yeah. When I was in Spokane, I, I knew this gal, but, uh, she worked at the university of uh, Wyoming in Laramie and, uh, um, there were some documents there, some files that related to the, uh, the Mormons hand carts, tracks and stuff like that. And I think, uh, they described some things very similar to what, uh, John Larson has, uh, had talked about. Um, anyway, she said that, Oh, the director of the library there was, uh, Mormon. And, uh, I, I think somebody came in to, to request those documents and, uh, when that guy tried to get them, they were missing <laughs> somehow. <laughs> gotcha. So uh, anyway, and the, the other thing I wanted to say is uh, in the last couple of weeks, I, I stumbled, I happened to meet this fellow that uh, we had a little conversation. It was around uh, at, at a Thanksgiving type dinner. And he is, a, <laughs> happens to be a, a state president. He's, and that. Uh, so I was asking him about, we're talking to him about uh, um, the Mormon church excommunicating a lot of people. And I mentioned a couple of names and I, one Sam Young was one of them. And, and oh, and he said, he's, he has a brother that, uh, oh, this state president also works for this uh, in the church office building. Anyway, um, and he says he has a brother who's an attorney who works for Curtin McConkie. And uh, his brother um, told him that uh, that he, that the attorney he that the attorney um, has more information as to why Sam Young was excommunicated, and, but wasn't willing to share. Uh, anyway, to yeah. me it just sounded like. Anyway, um, that's all I had. I appreciate it, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for the call. You bet. Thank yes. you. Bye. Yes, the vague smear job. By the state president on Sam Young. It wasn't really because he was just trying to protect children from being interviewed about sexual matters in private by an adult, the bishop. That's not why. There was some other reason that he was really excommunicated, but I don't want to get into it. Yeah, I've heard that game before. Yeah, that's why it's important that somebody record those uh, proceedings so that uh, you can get the state president audio telling you that you still have your integrity intact and you didn't do anything wrong. You are absolutely right about that, Bill. By the way, stealing documents from publicly held libraries and institutions is a long, uh, long established practice in the United States and probably elsewhere. I think it's one that the LDS Church may have perfected to an art form. But you remember 20 years ago, do you remember Sandy Berger? Mm -mm. He was in the Clinton administration. 
And I can't remember, I think he was secretary of state or maybe he was just the, the chief of staff. Anyway, that's um, uh, Sandy Berger. And so Clinton's no longer president. 2001, September 11 happens. And some time after that, he is in, was it the Library of Congress? I could look it up, but it's, it's, just, it's just a story here. It was either the Library of Congress or some other place. And he was stopped coming out of the room where he was looking at documents with several of them stuffed down his socks and his underpants, I believe. So that broke. A I remember huge, that. Do yeah. you remember that? Mm -hmm. OK, so I don't think that he was trying to get documents that were damaging to the LDS church, probably more to the Clinton administration, though I don't recall any reportage about what it was was in those specific documents. The, the story kind of died after that. But this is a long established practice that people will try and get documents that they perceive of as being damaging to them or people who are close to them and getting them out of the public eye. And so sometimes they have to go in, they have to take risks. Nobody said it was going to be easy. They only said it was going to be worth it, Bill, and get those things out of there. And I think that that's what they did with this dissertation by McBride from 76 and why it was that it was a threat of action on the part, I think it was Connell, who finally shook it loose. Yeah. I think it's the reason, by the way, I think it's the reason why folks like Kwaku and Cardinellis keep accusing you and I of being dishonest and lying is because what are you going to do when, as a believing member, when you learn that your apostolic pro prophetic church leaders have less integrity and lie, uh, have, a, have a level of dishonesty and uh, deception and it's the critic, the ex-Mormon podcasters who are telling you the honest story and giving you the data. It, it, it makes sense that they would have to besmirch you and besmirch me and to try to make comments about we're the ones who are lying about all this information. We're the ones twisting the facts, which I, I just don't get because we've never done. And I think people are, you know, people who follow our program go like those guys, those two guys right there lay out every issue and all of its messiness. They give you the sources. Go to the episode. Go to the episode on this one, guys, when you're listening oh, to Oh, you're it. talking about us now. I, I'm saying that Kwaku and Cardin Ellis accuse us of being dishonest, but they have to because the church leaders already are dishonest. And if you if, if the believing member comes to a observation that the ex-Mormon podcaster is the honest guy, then what do you do when you learn that your church leaders are the dishonest guy in the room? And so the only option those uh, those three guys have uh, is to is to make you and I out to be dishonest, so that the, so that we're on the same level playing field with their leaders. Hmm. And, and and I think I think it doesn't in the long run it hurts them worse because when somebody finally finds the rabbit hole and goes down it and learns that Mormonism is lied at every twist and turn, then then. At that point, you now look back at all the other people who helped hold up those lies, fair Mormon, uh, midnight Mormons, uh, people like, to be honest, Terrell Givens and Patrick Mason and Sam Brown and all those guys who are afraid to say the real stuff. Um, when you hurt people over a long period of time and they finally figure out you lied to them, you've been lying all along and all these other henchmen have been helping, it makes the betrayal so significantly greater. My point being, places like this are the places you get the full story. Where else were you going to get that Elder Oaks lied to you? Where else were you going to learn that Elder Oaks has done this for decades and it's demonstrable? It's on podcasts like this. So kudos to you, RFM. Um, kudos to to other truth tellers. And kudos to you, Bill Real. Yeah. I thought I would say it if no one else would. I knew you wouldn't say it about yourself. But you're right. This is one of the... Uh, important aspects of this story is that we have now caught Elder Holland prevaricating about something and doubling down on it when he had the chance to correct the record. Elder Oaks. Elder Holland's a liar too, but I think you mean Elder Oaks, right? I always get those two confused and I it's, don't know why. It's because they're both liars. Oh my gosh. Okay. I didn't say that. SCMC, yeah, you, I know you're watching. I didn't say that. They he can't get me that. anymore. They can't do anything else with me. I'm he already said out. That. I said prevaricating. I said dissembling. I said synonyms. I didn't yes. say the L word. Okay? Sue me. It'll hold up in court. Okay. But the problem is, the problem is, is that once you've got a glaring example, which is nailed shut, that he was not telling the truth. Okay. If he's yeah. done it here, where else is he not telling the truth? 
That's my question. Yeah. If you will, if you will uh, fabricate and gaslight, and I think this is technically gaslighting, trying to get you to believe something different about history than what really happened. If he will prevaricate on this subject, then there's no reason to believe he would not prevaricate on any other subject. Yeah, those are the questions that they'll avoid. 